So Matthew, welcome to the Wire to Wire podcast. It's great to have you on. Thank you, Seth. Great to be here, man. Um, so if you want to kind of get started and just tell the audience about yourself and what it is that you do. Absolutely. So um, I, I currently live in uh, Utah in the U.S. and I run marketing and growth for a tech company called QPilot. We do stuff with subscriptions and e-commerce. And as part of that, I do a lot of content. I'm a big educator. I love writing, creating, um, helping people figure things out. So that's a lot about what my job is. And and then I do some work with communities as well. So I do local events, um, run a couple Slack groups, things like that. Okay. And like in terms of the writing, do you do more like, are you a creative writer? Would you say more like copywriting? I used to be more creative writer <laughs> for sure. Um, and I've had to learn copy the last few years, you know, trying to get better at selling and stuff. And then you know, there's social writing as well, right? So like when I write a LinkedIn post or a tweet, those are two very different things when as opposed to maybe writing like a, a how-to manual or or writing copy for a website. That's interesting because I do a little bit of writing myself. Actually, that's how I got started. Mm -hmm. I was doing more um, like blog posting and then right. I transitioned to like authoring and screenwriting and stuff. Oh, that's cool. That's yeah. really cool. So we can kind of get into your story a little bit. So how did you get into this industry and this particular field um, in regards to tech? Sure, absolutely. It's funny. Um, a few years ago, uh, about yeah, five years ago, I was looking to kind of like restart my life and start a new career and stuff. And I'd gone back to school and I'm I'm 42 now, but at the time I was 37. And I've always loved marketing, but I felt like I was intimidated by the idea of getting into it full time because I thought, you know, it's just a bunch of young kids on, 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 uh, you know, Snapchat and TikTok and just like crushing these, these things that I maybe am not going to be that good at. So I thought, okay, I'll get into tech. And I actually got an information systems degree and thought, all right, well, I'll get into some coding or something else. Cause you know, I figured technology is always changing. So it doesn't matter if I had experience or not. And, um, as I was doing that, I kind of got a job at this one, uh, shipping technology company, just to kind of do some experiment. They were just running some experiments on doing some agency type work. And, and next thing you know, they needed a marketer to take over their core business and start doing marketing for them and content creation. So uh, walking away from marketing, but getting into tech brought me back to doing marketing for tech. So it's just kind of one of those funny things about life, you know? Um, and, and what I've learned since then is that, you know, the fact that there's a million marketers or 10 or 100 million marketers on the planet, like actually just means that there's a really big opportunity to differentiate yourself. So um, there's a lot of people doing it just because there's young, old people doing it for a long time doesn't mean you can't find a pl your place in the world, you know? Yeah, there's a couple of things you said there that I find to be interesting. Um, So one of them is that you mentioned that you were 37. So yeah, it kind of sends a message that it's never too late, right? Because right. oftentimes there's that fear. Um, would you say that you experienced that fear being at that age? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, going back to school, I was surrounded by a bunch of 20, 22 year old kids that had just gotten out of high school. And for me, I hadn't been back to school for a long time and it's intimidating. Um, you know, I would get asked in some interviews, like, are you okay reporting to somebody younger than you? And I'm like, yeah, I don't, I, I wasn't thinking about it till you just said that, but um, I think really for me, it's been a really interesting journey of like, I just remember sitting in class and a couple, you know, there's all these kids around me trying to figure out what to do with their lives. And and in many ways, no matter how old you are, you're trying to figure out what to do with your life. Like, even if you're established and have the family and the career and all this success, many people are still taking stock and trying to figure out well, what do I want to do next and who am I and how do I present myself to this world? And so for me, it's been a good journey of like, of understanding that and being okay not knowing everything. And, and it, I feel like it gives me a good perspective because I'm, I'm an older guy. So I have a little more wisdom on some things, but I don't claim to know all, everything. So I can be open to learning and learning from other people. So for you being at the place that you are now with the work that you do, um, what would you say are some of the key things that helped you find or achieve a certain level of success in the field of uh, marketing and tech? Yeah. I think the first thing is being a, being open to new opportunities. I, I took a couple of risks and trying something new. Some of them didn't work out at all, but it put me in a position where I was meeting more people. And, and when somebody, when, you know, the company I was working for was like, Hey, we're going to invest in our core business instead of these experiments you're running. Do you want to help and do marketing? I, 
I could have said, no, that's not what I signed up for. I was like, no, that sounds cool. I, I, that's actually sounds really interesting to me. And so I, I went and did it. And, and so I think that's the first thing is being open to taking risks and, and new opportunities. Be like the person that says yes. Like, yes, I'm willing to try that. Yes, I'm willing to figure that out because people really value that as a skill. Um, and then I think the other thing is like learning to double down on your strengths. Like, you know, when I when I left the shipping company and joined QPilot, you know, we, we've run a lot of different marketing experiments and some things have worked okay and some things didn't, you know, and, but when I get back, to, when you go back to the drawing board, it's like, well, what are my strengths? Well, my strengths are connecting with people and, and, and education and content. Okay. Well, that's what we invested in this year. You know, we, we launched a new program around content and education around subscriptions. That's why I'm talking to you on this podcast is because we're trying to, trying to put myself out there more for that. So, so I think that's the other thing is even though you might not have a ton of experience in the space that you're working in, like what, what are the strengths you can bring to the table and, and, and can you double down on those and, and figure out how to make those work for you and the business to make money? Yeah. And you mentioned a uh, Q pilot. So if you want to discuss a little bit about um, what QPilot is and what is like, and what is their functions? Sure. Yeah. So if you think about a lot of times people are ordering more stuff online, um, Amazon obviously is really popular. Amazon has a subscribe and save experience. And there's a lot of brands out there, Shopify owners, WooCommerce, you name it, that are selling a variety of products that they want the same, they want the same thing, a subscription option. And um, it's actually can be a little bit more complex than you might think. Just getting something on repeat, there's a lot of functionality that goes in there to make things not break. And so QPilot is kind of like an add-on to websites. We do a lot of processing and logic behind the scenes that a lot of brands don't don't understand. And, and honestly, they don't need to. They should be focusing on their core business. So basically what it means is you could go to like, um, you know, like if you look at Chewy or Dollar Shave Club, they've got these really like flexible and powerful subscribe and save experiences where you the customer can manage everything. We're giving that same kind of experience to smaller merchants, you know, um, so that they can offer that to their customers too. Yeah, I think subscription is actually a very interesting field in a way because I think it's evolved a lot over time. Like before, it was just like with magazines, right? You yes. subscribe to a magazine, it gets sent right. to you. But now, like you're seeing that model be adopted across different sectors. So for example, like with music streaming, um, video, like video on demand and that kind of stuff. So in your experience in this field, right, when it comes to dealing with like subscriptions, what are some strategies that businesses could adopt that could help them make that transition to, um, um, to a subscription based model? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is like, from a really broad perspective, if you're, you can look, I look at it as there's two types of ways to approach it. The first one is um, access. So everything you like, like digital content, right? Like you can't get, you can't watch your favorite show on Netflix unless you have a Netflix subscription. Like you can't access masterclass on writing screenplays if you don't have a masterclass subscription, right? Um, and so if you're creating a digital good that people want, you can you can put that behind a paywall and they subscribe to have access right so that's kind of like the one i think that we're all the most familiar with the other one i think if you think about it as, a, as a form of engagement so it's like whether it's a physical product it's typically like a physical product something you're getting consistently you're using consistently how can i make it easier for the customer to get that right like a, a really classic example is actually like um you're getting you buy uh, an air filter for your house so you've got this air filters air, air filtration system you're going to get an air filter to replace it every year now if you normally have to think about reordering an air filter like you might forget or it might just whatever you go looking for it somewhere else you can set up an auto ship or like an auto replenishment to get the air filter automatically so you don't have to think about it for me i'm a ball guy i shave i shave my head a lot i have a dollar shave club subscription i don't want to have to think about getting razors for my head right and then the next version of that is going more engaged going deeper into the engagement standpoint is like okay say i want to buy some a weight loss supplement or i i don't sleep well so i take i personally take cbd to help me sleep all right well a brand the cbd subscription i have like they could ask me more about my sleep problems to get more information because I really hate that as a problem. And now they can get more information from me. I'm getting their product. I like their product. It helps me. So now they have this, now there's this engagement and there's an opportunity for them to go deeper with content, other products, 
Hey, Matt, have you tried this? Have you tried this? And so that's where I think the real beauty of subscriptions is, is you can make it something you set and forget. You can make it something you have access to, or you can make it something where you're creating a deeper engagement and a stronger relationship with your customer. Okay. And when it comes to a company like QPilot, right? Are you guys dealing with other companies that have already established themselves as subscription-based businesses or are they mm-hmm. or are they more looking to start adopting that kind of a strategy? It, it's a funny question. We we work with both. So we do get people that come in that are that are new to the space, but it's one of those things where like until you've done it, you don't know all the problems associated with it. So it's like you think, oh, I just put this on my website and then it's easy. And 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 so a lot of times when I do calls with customers like that, it's it's hard to say like, don't do it. <laughs> you don't know what you don't know yet. And so sometimes they just have to go learn it for themselves. For us, our best customers are people that have been trying to do it because we are we already know some of the pains based on the solutions they've been using. And so we're able to like, you know, make their life a lot easier and it makes us look better. So um, so we we work with both, but we really do like the people that are, have already been doing it because we can deliver a lot of value for them. Yeah. Um, do you have like any like recent examples of like a company that was struggling with the model before and then you guys kind of came in, use your expertise and help them, you know, find the success that they were looking for? Yeah, I mean, we just had one just uh, last week that they they did some demos and stuff with us uh, six months ago. Um, They're a CBD company and um, there's a fairly cheap plugin on WooCommerce called WooCommerce subscriptions. And that's how a lot of people start out. And they're like, nah, you know, you guys are 50 bucks a month to start. Like we can just buy this $150 plugin. And so they used that for six months. And then now they've come back and they said, Hey, we have operational issues and inventory management issues and our customers can't control this and that. And it's like, yeah, we've got, we can fix all those things for you. So it's really a, like a layer of sophistication that you just don't kind of know about till you're running it. And we just try to make things so it seems really, really easy to the customer to the end user, right? If they want to change their subscription, you know, like you want to get to a something or you're going to be in a different city or you want to pause it or change the schedule. It should be all really simple and intuitive and then also easy on the business when those changes happen. And so that's what we do really well. Okay. And what, from your experience working in this industry, like what would you say are some of the benefits that businesses get um, when they switch over to a subscription-based model? Yeah, I think the two big things. I mean, from a finance standpoint, businesses love the predictable revenue part, right? Like, you know, if I know that I have like 5,000 subscriptions, uh, that that means I have X revenue that I can predict out in the future. And I know what my churn rate is, say I lose like 5% a month. So it's like, I can start planning and I could maybe even like, you know, get a loan or borrow money to bridge if I needed something. Right. Um, I think the other part though, is what it makes it really interesting is like that engagement part I mentioned is like, you know, if people are on a subscription, they're more likely to engage with your content, maybe want to be part of a community, give you feedback on product. There's upsell opportunities. You've essentially done all the hard part, which is acquiring the customer and the subscription model lets you like get a, capture a lot more value out of that. So you can end up making a lot more profit. Mm-hmm. And do you think like with your expertise, like, do you think any business would be able to just adopt a subscription model or do you think that there has to be certain key benchmarks that have already been met i think it, th- th- there's there's a couple of things so one if you're selling something that people are buying more than once you should be looking at a subscription model so if it's even if it's something they're buying every year right like i mentioned that air filter i've seen subscriptions for like pillowcases and sheets right because people are buying those Um, So I think if you're looking at your repeat purchase history, you should start to look to see, do I have people that are buying something more more than once? And if so, this is a possible subscription option. The other thing is if people are requesting that, because a lot of times people are already thinking subscriptions like, oh, you'll give me 10% off. I'm already buying this every couple of months. I might as well have a subscription. So there's that part too. Um, the, The other thing would be thinking about is there an engagement opportunity here that that maybe people are missing? So I, I don't like, I, I think it's a mistake when you're like, oh, I just want to go to subscriptions because that, that makes sense for revenue. It's more like, is there an additional value or service, whether that's a membership or a subscription option? So even if you're selling like, uh, 
say some like just access to a digital good and and that's already kind of like a subscription but you maybe want to add something more you can add services or other value on top of that and it really comes down to understanding why people are coming to you so if you know like your what your customer is looking for and you can ask them what more can you get what more can you do um i think that's really where you you want to start with and it, if you start to unpack, oh, this is something people would want regularly, then you have a subscription model. Yeah, it's interesting. Like one of the reasons why I actually found like this topic to be an interesting one is because, you know, as I'm like reading different articles about businesses and stuff, I see more businesses are starting to explore the viability of uh, subscriptions. Yeah. So one of the examples I saw is like, you know, Apple was looking to find a way to make the iPhone like to, right. like to sell iPhones through a subscription model. Yeah. But then I wonder like how something like that would work, like subscri subscribing to being able to get a new phone versus the financing model that's already in place. So I kind of wonder how they can make something like that work. I've, I thought about that too. So I did a, <laughs> I was chatting with a buddy about this a few months ago and we were trying, scratching our eyes, trying to figure out, and this is what, what I think the reason it works. So, the idea would be you pay them, for example, 50 bucks a month. And every time a new phone comes out, you get a new phone. So if they release phones every six months, nine months, a year, it doesn't matter. You're paying 50 bucks a month, you get the new phone. But as soon as you have the new phone comes out, you have to send them in the old one. So they're maybe not making a ton of money on, they're getting the old phone back. What I think it means is, is it is an opportunity for them to sell you more. If you're more likely to want to get a new phone all the time, then you're probably willing to get a new Apple Watch all the time. You're going to get the new AirPods every time. So I think what it does is it allows them to have more data around what your buying behavior and that, because the reason I say that is what ends up happening with other subscription businesses is it's like, if you can get somebody to use an app, like if you, have you ever seen like you're in the McDonald's drive through and they're trying to get you to like, you know, go and order get free fries off the app. <laughs> They're not just pushing you to the app because, because they think it's cool or they can own that channel. Those are good reasons. But the main reason is because they know that people that use the app spend more money than people that don't. And so ultimately that's why, where the subscriptions come from is if they can push you into, so that's why I think Apple's doing that is they probably know or they believe that they're because they're testing it. If if somebody's willing to do this, they will spend more money with Apple. And that might be item products, that might be digital, that could be all kinds of stuff, as opposed to somebody who doesn't. And that would be the main reason why. Yeah, that, that makes sense what you're saying, because I think even if you look at like their core business, it was hardware, right? But mm -hmm. I think it's kind of reached that maturity stage. And now they're finding that their service business is actually growing exponentially, right? So now they have an opportunity where they can find a way to leverage the services more as maybe the hardware right. reaches like past its peak, right? Yep. So exactly. I think that, yeah, so I think that is a, that makes sense on their part, obviously. But I was just kind of more confused about the logistic, like the logistics of it. But I think the way you're explaining it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, maybe it's a play just to steal more Samsung users. You know, yeah. maybe like there could be a lot of reasons why. I mean, there's some really smart people that work there, but <laughs> smarter than me. But uh, that is how I would think about it. Is they're seeing an opportunity to steal market share, and you're right. Like the the phones might not be the profitable part of their business anymore. Sure, they make money off of them. But, you know, if they're selling me iCloud storage for $10 a month and it costs them two pennies, right? Like that's massive profit margins, uh, you know, Apple Music, all the things. Yeah. yeah, that is true. So what, so if you, from your experience, you know, working with QPilot, what would you say has been some of the feedback that has been shared in regards to people that have like the experience they were having before using it and after using QPilot, what has been some of the feedback that you've heard um, in regards to it? For us, we we started on WooCommerce and WordPress as a platform. So, um, you know, I think a lot of people are used to Shopify things working the way you expect. WordPress is kind of hard. So we've built a solution that, I mean, it works the way you would think it would work without a lot of the stuff that normally bogs down in WordPress. So a lot of the feedback is that it just does, it works well. Um, and, and when it doesn't work well, we have a really great support team. We're a product led team, like we're small ish and most of our team are developers and customer support people. So we're very much like 
product customer centric. Um, so that's kind of a big deal. And then for us, the other feedback would be just around, we really lower the overhead when it comes to management. So what you have to do to operate the subscription business is drastically less with us is a lot, a lot of the feedback we get to. Yeah. So I would imagine you probably get users who might say something along the lines of, well, I don't know if I'm going to need it this amount of time. So why am I going to pay for something in advance? Right. Right. So when you hear an objection like that, what is like, what do you, like what do you do to like reassure the person that there is value in using this kind of service yeah i mean well as i mentioned before like sometimes if they're new to it you're not going to be able to convince them right like if i tell somebody this is harder than you think <laughs> you know they're just this guy's just selling something but um a lot of times it just comes down to like asking for me as 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 marketing and 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 what i do with sales too is I just ask questions around what, how much time people are spending doing things. Like how much time are you spending changing an order for a customer? How often does somebody try to change their subscription? What do you, what happens when you try to do that? And so when you start to unpack those types of questions, you, you get somebody to say like, oh yeah, like we get, even if it's just two requests a week, well, how much time do you spend doing that? Oh, well, it takes me 30 minutes to do that. Well, so 50 bucks a month isn't worth 30 minutes a week for you like you know th 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 that's that's how i kind of approach sales and, and if it's not that then you know there are times and this has been part of my journey too is there are times when you're just not going to convince somebody if they're not willing to see if they don't have that as a pain or as a problem that's fine like there's a lot of other solutions they can go with but as soon as they start to see some of those problems it's like hey give us a shot because we can make your life a lot easier yeah i think i think you touched on some key things there um, I think a lot of times, you know, in elements of like business sales and marketing, like a key common factor between them is just dealing with people, right? And knowing how to interact with them. And, you know, sometimes you're right, you're not going to make that sale necessarily, right. but they go off on their own. And then if you've done a good enough job with connecting with them and at least like establishing um, that rapport with them, they could at least experience it on their own, realize like, hey, it's not working out. And then they'll actually willingly come back because right. there was that human element to it, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell, you know, I, I always think of that whole thing with like Macy's back in the day where, uh, you know, the, I don't know if you've seen the Miracle of 34th Street, but it's like they talk about, you know, if we can't, if we can't get it for you, we'll, we'll show you where you can. So if we're not a good fit for somebody, I'm more than happy to point them in the right direction. Um, it, and it, what's interesting is that it's not just good customer service, but it's a good way to run a business. That way we don't waste a lot of time running after customers that are actually not going to be a good fit for us or we're not going to be a good fit for them because then it's just a bad, bad fit. Yeah, that is true too. Yeah. Um, so at this part of the podcast, I have a segment that I do called Open Floor, right? Yeah. So you just have uninterrupted time. Is there anything that you would like to communicate to the audience or anything that you'd like to discuss? Um, yeah. I mean, for me, I think what's really kind of fun about the future of subscriptions is this idea of where the, the idea is you want to keep people from shopping again. So you, you, if you're getting pet food, you don't want somebody to not buy it from you. You you don't want them to go to Petco or PetSmart looking for that brand. You want to keep them getting pet food from you. And so a lot of way, what's really exciting is that there's more and more engagement. There's text notifications now and chat. You can go down a chat bot to manage your subscription. And I think the future is uh, going to be a lot more integrated. It's not going to be all completely automated. There's still going to be a personal component, but I think that's what's kind of fun about subscriptions is the opportunity to keep customers from shopping at least shopping for what you're selling uh, anywhere else. And then also um, engaging with them more. So, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I get that makes sense actually, because it's that need has already been met. So why buy it? Like why look right. else? Right. Right. So yeah, that does uh, make sense. Um, and Matthew, where can people get connected with you? Are you on social media or anything? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Holman on LinkedIn. Um, I'm subscription doc on Twitter and TikTok. Um, do a lot of content on there. I'm, I mean, the videos, maybe not as much as I was doing for a while, but um, yeah. And I've got a weekly subscription newsletter. So if you're interested in subscriptions at all, um, I do a weekly dose of the subscription prescription, just trying to help people figure out how to grow their subscription programs. Okay, perfect. I'm going to link all that stuff in the description of this episode as well. So people will be able to find it. 
But awesome. um, yeah, it's been, it's been great having you on. Uh, great conversation. Yeah. And yeah, until next time. Great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Take care.